Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? OK, good. Um, some of you know that I spilled a little bit of water on the previous laptop before I was setting up my presentation. So this one is kind of finicky. Um, please let me know if something doesn't seem to add up with the images. Um, so I was going to do a brief introduction, but I want to thank Greg for doing that. And I guess I'll start um, by talking about Trinosoph. Uh, Trinosoph, as Greg mentioned, is a space that I started with my partner, Joel Peterson, who's a musician and a composer. Um, he's also a concert programmer at the Arab American National Museum. Since 2012, Trinosoph has presented more than 200 performances, screenings. Oh, I, I can already tell it's off track. That's OK. Um, has presented uh, more than 200 performances, screenings, readings, and exhibitions per year. We began programming while the site was still a construction zone back in 2011 as a way of setting our priorities straight. And it was more important for us to begin the work that we found so necessary in the region rather than focusing on whether or not we had decent lighting. I'm just going to stop for a second and see if I can change the slide. Hold on. I should do it. Um, so Trina stuff is located in Eastern Market, um, but we've always felt that it could be located anywhere in the city. Um, the location wasn't terribly important to us. The precursor to Trina Soap was Bohemian National Home, which you see an image of behind me. And it was uh, Joel's project, principally. It was in the middle of a residential neighborhood formerly known as Western Market off 22nd Street in Michigan. And it was an old Czech social hall that was about 15,000 square feet. Um, following up with the work from Bohemian National Home, Trina Soap is an art space that we like to think is dynamic and responsive to change. With more than a decade of combined work at nonprofit institutions, it was clear to both of us from the get-go that the nonprofit structure had a tendency to inhibit growth. And um, it allowed little room for risk-taking because it often leads you down the wrong programming path to appease funders. Um, so what our model instead is that we use income from the cafe and modest revenue from the gallery sales uh, to produce programming focusing on quality rather than being genre specific. And we've presented artists from all the major continents. Um, I think Antarctica excluded. So I assume I was invited to the discussion not because of my encyclopedic knowledge of the city's uh, independent and commercial gallery scene, uh, but because of my personal experience. The talk is about the few spaces and projects and ideas around town that have shaped my and Joel's collective vision, uh, perspective, and identity today. For starters, there isn't really such a thing as an independent. This would mean that the entity doesn't depend or rely on something else for existence or operation. It would not be conditioned by anything else. I know of very few places in the city's history, nor in this day and age, that are truly independent. Take, for instance, the long-running anarchist art space in Woodbridge, Trumbleplex Theater, or Willis Gallery in the Cass Corridor. Both employ a co-op structure and have defied expectations by lasting decades. Willis is now closed, but Trumbleplex is still open. And while they may have operated without a hierarchy in place, they still rely on someone in order to pay the bills, and it's usually a benevolent landlord. The term alternative is outdated as well, it seems. Um, you probably know it was coined in New York in the 1960s, following um, the inception of conceptual process and installation art as a critique of the commercialized and aestheticized restrictions of the art world. Um, making art in response to this wasn't enough, and so people developed spaces to challenge commercial and institutional settings. Um, they developed to politically um, and spiritually uh, defy that kind of structure. But we all implicitly engage traditional formats these days, no matter how alternative or independent we think we are, um, through our model, our branding, our marketing strategies, however low-key, um, our design, our look and feel. So maybe more to the point, traditional formats now have their eyes on us. 
All spaces while resting at the borders still operate in response to, in proximity to, and within the art world mainstream. A more appropriate term for alternative spaces was recently suggested by a friend, Richard Newman, who um, runs the Hinterland Theater Group, interdependent. We all are reliant on each other. The more interesting question is why do these spaces exist? Liminal spaces exist to fill a void in the local art ecosystem and they're driven by mostly local concerns. I wanna start by talking about a space that has influenced what I do because it influenced the established artists in the community that I admire. The Minor Key was a coffee shop on the west side that showcased jazz in the early 60s. It was a performance venue. There were many clubs like it, of course, mostly bars. The Hobby Car, the Grand on Joy Road, the Drone, for example. Artists would go in at 2 a.m. and play until the sun came up. But the Minor Key didn't sell booze, so they weren't really making very much money. Profit was clearly not the end game. Because it wasn't a bar, it was all ages. Writers George Tisch and playwright Bill Harris both claim that the minor key was pivotal in their youth. Music at the minor key was their first introduction to the art scene, long before they developed curiosity about writing, theater, or visual art. The latter came actually much later. It could be considered an alternative also because its priorities was in taking risks, showcasing top flight musicians like Miles Davis. It was a risk because even back then, a show by Davis came with a big guarantee but booking him meant that you were putting your space on the international map. But the impetus for opening an art space is even more local than that. It's local as in personal. First and foremost, it's deeply personal. An alternative art space exists because of its founders. It's formed, arranged, or done in a particular way for a particular purpose only. Lately, I keep thinking about the image of the three-legged uh, greyhound, which you saw earlier as a metaphor for our space and the work that we're trying to do. Those who develop these ad hoc spaces become a part of a network locally and nationally, and this forms a kind of cumulative identity. Commercial galleries and institutions are usually in the business of reflecting culture. Alternative spaces, on the other hand, are more actively involved in the creation and shaping of culture. There was a time when the only way an emerging artist could get an exhibition was to pass through the turnstile of critics. I think it's a lot easier in the art world today. In Detroit in the 1960s, Red Door Gallery served as a counterpoint to the traditional academic instruction in the art school at Wayne State University. Red Door Gallery was a cooperative that ran from summer of 63 through September of 64, founded by Lenny Sinclair, Harvey Columbus, Larry Weiner, Carl and Sheila Schurer, and George Tisch. The Red Door's approach was non-academic. The gallery was not attempting to buck the traditional critical and commercial system, though. On the contrary, Tisch states that he would send a year's worth of press releases to the local papers at once and would get totally ignored. Still, their approach was renegade from academia. This is an image promoting an exhibition of paintings by Aizou Nishira, who taught mathematics at Wayne State. In the mid-1970s, Strata Publishing Company opened Strata Concert Gallery on Selden Street in the Cass Corridor, emphasizing the work of local artists only. It was a central vehicle for the exposure of music, film, plays, and visual art. Strata already offered trade services as a recording studio, publishing house, and it offered arts management counseling. The emphasis here was on self-determination, principally in the black community. It was a one-stop shop. They chiefly presented spiritual jazz, and this was a political action. It was a peaceful expression coming out of the disquiet of the late 60s in Detroit. Artist Stephen Goodfellow's Bastard Gallery in the Cass Corridor emphasized the similarity between an alternative art space and an artwork itself. He only did a few shows from 78 to 81 in the defunct Willis Gallery once Willis moved to the Fisher Building in the New Center and left the old gallery in the corridor empty. His first exhibition in 78 was inspired by the book, The Illuminati Trilogy, a fiction about a world in which mankind enslaves itself, egged on by a few uh, powerful uh, men. And it consisted of a mural on the back wall, 12 tarot suite drawings, and eight Illuminatus suite chalk drawings. And people who were familiar with the old Willis Gallery showed up, and I, um, as the story goes, I think he sold all of the work. 
I want to skip ahead a bit to Maureen Mackey and Billy Hunter's Two South Gallery in the 90s, which operated for just a few years out of our second floor Capitol Park loft. The exhibition space was essentially a long corridor, and I think it was one of the first apartment galleries in the city. Mackey's loft presented a concept that hadn't really existed before, and I think it's hard to imagine this as unusual, but people with no previous connection to the art scene started showing up at the openings. It was the first gallery that was more of a scene rather than a straight gallery per se, and it built the scene beyond art appreciators. Of course, they got burnt out after a while. The party got too big. People showed up just to um, get drunk, and um, I think that Mackey ended up moving to LA shortly thereafter. But um, it seems that these types of spaces, uh, no matter what city you live in, seem to die out in one of two ways. People either um, get too out of control crazy with it, or they get too boring because someone tries to professionalize it and it ruins the vibe. Zoot's Coffee House was located in the San Francisco house that is adjacent to the Bronx Bar on 2nd Avenue, also in the 90s. I've sat with my partner, uh, Joel, and made him explain in detail to me, since I wasn't around, what the condition of the place was, how the staff acted, what kind of drinks they served, what the furniture looked like, just to get a sense of what it was like to be there and why it was so important to people in the art and music scene. It's pretty safe to say that it's my slightly older generation's Detroit Artist Workshop or Willis Gallery. The building itself was owned by the Monroe family, Irving Monroe being the DSO star flautist. He was another benevolent landlord. And what was significant about Zoots was not the risks it took because most of the bands that played there hadn't been heard of yet. It consolidated an audience in the region for particular types of music and art, becoming the venue for a new wave of Detroit creatives in the 1990s, where local bands got their start. So these are the forerunners who have influenced how I work today, and I'm sure you notice that I haven't mentioned very many commercial galleries. Probably none. Um, that's not to say there haven't been any or that there aren't any important ones now. The Gertrude Castle Gallery comes to mind. It operated from 1965 to the mid-70s, and it was in Detroit's new center, which would later become a city center for the gallery district. Castle's goal was to introduce the city to uh, leading contemporary artists, including William de Kooning, Helen Frankenthaler, Robert Motherwell, and Kleis Oldenburg. But she also showed those who were just becoming known. The gallery fostered many local Detroit artists, giving them their first shows, including Al Loving and Brenda Goodman. It produced original prints of contemporary artists, which gave them access to many artists that would otherwise be unattainable, and I think that this is a really interesting model, whether you're an alternative space or a commercial gallery. But in general, at this point, um, we are absent in art market. We have a very small commercial gallery scene, and it's because Detroit is a city nearly without art patrons, and commercial art galleries follow the money. Most American cities operate under a mixed economies approach. Arts and culture are supported by both public funding as well as private funding from corporations, individuals, and foundations. The balance is optimal because pure government control is, um, leads to propaganda and corruption, and uh, pure capitalism is just abhorrent. <laughs> in the whole country, of course, institutions struggle without much public support ever since the Reagan era, while in Europe, institutions are nearly entirely funded by the government, which means directors aren't even really necessary. They only hire curators. Here, uh, the leaders of academic and cultural institutions are fundraisers. It's their primary responsibility to get patrons to understand why art and culture is worth supporting, why their university or museum or center is worth the money, and why it's worth their legacy. Our institutions are in part responsible for the city's lack of patronage. This isn't a blame game. A very atypical set of circumstances surrounds our local economy, and that fact plays a role in how institutional leaders choose to spend their time and money. But I do want to make a pitch it's absolutely crucial for institutional leaders to support galleries that, in turn, support local artists. Institutional leaders need to attend opening with openings with patrons. Um, for starters, they need to show up at openings. They need to buy work from galleries. We haven't seen this kind of support since the DIA's curator, Sam Wagstaff, 
And we see it now with Suzanne Hilberry, whose institutional credibility, working with Wagstaff, lent itself onto and transitioned over to the commercial scene. Her opinion carries its own institutional weight. She has made a name for local artists internationally in her role as a gallerist. I also see Alicia Reeder, MOCAD's director, making that effort. Our lack of patrons also has to do with corporations. Support was strong in the 80s and 90s, and it meant that patrons weren't needed. Um, we also don't have a strong nonprofit scene. This can be attributed to the lack of public support. Um, just briefly, when Governor Engler started his term in 93, our arts budget was in the top dozen, and when he left in uh, office, I think it was in 2002 or 2003, we were at the bottom. And Granholm came in and cut the budget even further. Of course, Kwame Kilpatrick's administration eradicated the Department of Arts and Cultural Affairs. So when the financial crisis hit in 2009, we were left with nothing, little corporate support, little government support, and no patrons. That's why the money has started coming in from private foundations, and this has shaped the art scene considerably, including alternatives. Private foundations and real estate developers are the new patrons. As the fiduciary arm of corporations, private foundations have certain interests. They are interested in economic vitality. Their work is propelled via real estate and the mass media. Real estate developers recognize that there is money to be made where artists are found. In 2010, Dennis Scholl, former VP of Arts for Knight Foundation, who is a contemporary art collector, introduced Tony Goldman to Detroit's art community in a round of presentations held at a gallery located at a space um, next to Trina Sof, before Trina Sof was there. Um, Goldman was the man responsible for today's version of the high-end Soho that we know, as well as the Bori, and was the developer behind South Beach in Miami, including the Wynwood Mural Project located in a small commercial industrial district. He passed away in 2012. Jeremiah Moss, who publishes a blog called Vanishing New York that the New York Times calls an excellent job of cataloging all that's constantly being sacrificed to the god of rents, cites Goldman's Guide to Neighborhood Building 101. Quote, control the street life and effectuate what the vibe is going to be, end quote. Goldman Properties owned a wall at Houston Street in Bowery since 1984, and it has long been an open canvas for graffiti artists. In 2008, he partnered with Deitch Projects to cre recreate a Keith Haring work. Again in 2010, they partnered on two more murals, the latter by Shepard Ferry. Moss says Goldman is the man who transforms areas with urban grit into luxury lifestyle destinations. Dennis Scholl brought Goldman to town, and he was scouting properties at the riverfront stretching to the eastern market. In downtown Detroit, Bedrock Properties has taken a cue from Goldman's work with Shepard Ferry's recent unveiling. So now it becomes a question of the cultural legacy of the city, its authenticity, as well as its trajectory. Art that is used as advertising represents the very absence of culture and civilization. In my own neighborhood in Eastern Market, Red Bull House of Art has covered hand-painted signs from old food wholesalers with graffiti murals. Whether or not you enjoy the murals, as Moss notes, it's important to keep in mind that there might be a hidden subtext, that they are in fact a cog in the wheel of the big machine, end quote. This is the context in which I find myself questioning nearly every day what my role is in the Detroit art scene. As I mentioned earlier, my first priority is personal. I produce exhibitions for my own edification, projects that make for compelling research and conversation, and usually exist somewhere on the margins. Organizing things for Joel can be as interesting as performing, or for me, writing a story. Our interests and approach are in constant flux, but in general, we program what we want to see in here. But secondarily, locally, we are also both interested in redistributing wealth and increasing local cultural vitality. I've been following tangentially the work of the One Mile Project, among many others, for this reason. In 2014, the One Mile Project was the recipient of a $150,000 art place grant to preserve an important piece of Detroit's cultural history, a one mile linear strip on Oakland between East Grand Boulevard and Westminster. 
That area has a long cultural history, including being home to the Phelps Lounge, which was an important space for soul and R&B. Uh, this image is a photo of an official rec uh, recreation of the P-Funk mothership that is now in the Smithsonian. I believe it's located in the space where George Clinton first performed with Funkadelic. Maybe some music fans could verify that for me. Um, the group claims that they will cultivate new civic space outdoors for the neighborhood and have already gotten a moratorium on all demolition happening on the Strip. They promised the creation of galleries, music venues, and other spaces to showcase neighborhood artists and are compiling oral histories from around the block. It seems like a lot to do, but it's a project space I'm interested in following with a very specific context. As I mentioned, alternative spaces these days must learn to operate within the art world structure. In 2014, Trina Sof was awarded with a grant from the Knight Foundation for a commissioning project. That project includes a prize. We are using our awarded funds to re-gift a $5,000 no-strings cash prize to an artist of under-recognized contribution to the region. We believe too many of our greatest artists are missing the opportunity to interface with funders directly. This in no way reflects their cultural importance or their ability to complete complex projects. It just means that they have not been afforded the chance to cultivate that skill set. The impetus for this award is to correct that injustice. There are transplants from across the country and overseas who are now opening the city up to models of art spaces and galleries that exist elsewhere. At least one of the leaders of the One Mile Project I mentioned is an architect from France who teaches at U of M. Following the recent publication of an article in the New York Times <laughs> entitled, Last Stop on the L Train, Detroit, an artist with a blog recently asked me what I might say to artists who are looking to move here from New York. My response was this. I find that New Yorkers' perspectives, no matter how creative they may be, have been built around parameters of property, both intellectual and real. This has never really been the case in Detroit. A widened sense of spiritual consciousness, which has its roots in the black community here, as well as the lack of any real art market, has shifted Detroiters' parameters to the communal. So you shouldn't just move here if you are interested in a wet page. If you're interested in how you may be better served by being in Detroit or how your art may be better served by being in the city, or even in how the city may be better served by your presence, you should move here if you have a genuine inclination to redefine your understanding of what belongs to you, what is owed to you, what you deserve, what you need, what you want, and what money can buy. Thank you. Sure, let's field some questions in conversation. Does Greg have any questions? I will start by asking the audience. Does, does anyone have any questions or comments that they want to share? Gary. I don't think I need hey, you do. <laughs> I work very hard for this okay. audience. My question really is this. How does... Uh, the city of Detroit, the way it operates within the art community. How does it what? I'm sorry. How does it operate within the city of Detroit, the art community, the issue of boosterism as opposed to real, real criticism? What is helping it? What's hurting it? Could you, could you repeat again? I'm sorry. The beginning of, the beginning part of your question? Well, the, 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 the question is, I'll rephrase it. How does either the way boosterism and or true art criticism help or hinder the art community? Um, well, I want to start by saying, I guess, I think it's interesting to me that art criticism is one of the um, 
awards for the fellowships that the Kresge, art Found the Kresge Foundation is offering because I don't really think it's an art form. Um, I, I could be wrong in that, but I think it is, um, is secondary to the arts. Um, and I think that it promotes a public dialogue. And of course, you know, real criticism is hard to find these days. You're either dealing with um, straight reporting and detail, or you have the poet critics who are more interested in their own voice um, than they are in what they're talking about. But I think criticism, the role of criticism is to really connect what's happening here and now to um, a longer trajectory. So what came before it and what might be coming next, as well as a larger tra trajectory of what's happening possibly outside the local um, area. And so it serves a really critical role and, and it's just, that's also totally absent right now. So it is all part of the same dialogue. Lynn? Um, I just have to beg to differ about how you just characterized um, like poetic response to art. I think sometimes mm -hmm. um, there's something almost arrogant about a review or a critique. And I think some writers, some creative writers, want to maybe launch a dialogue. And they, they really almost want to sub, sub, um, like submerge their voice right. and try to give platform to the artwork and maybe have people look at it differently. I think it might be a matter of just how we're describing it, because I, I think that a lot of artists do write about work and it does offer critique, but I, I guess I don't think of it in the general field of criticism. I think of that as, um, as a form of literary arts, even if it's contributing to a critique of, the, um, of artwork. But maybe it's just a conversation, not a critique. You know, right. Maybe it's like somebody's playing a certain drum beat and somebody plays a certain right. guitar, and then it's, you know, it's like a band gets together, and, and yeah. so it's sort of... Yeah, that's, I, I agree with you. I think... Um, I do think, though, that when, I, when we're thinking about criticism, that there's, there's kind of inherent in it this idea that um, it's supposed to kind of make this connection, this larger connection. You might have to come up here. Howdy, howdy. Thank you very much. Wonderful speech. Um, my question is more about uh, spaces and the organizational uh, community aspect. Um, obviously, there are several spaces and plenty more to be reclaimed in the city, um, but not every artist can go grab a space, start something going. I right. mean, we'd splatter out and not get much steam. What would be your suggestion to young artists as far as uh, collaborating or utilizing places like Trinisovs or yeah. places like MoCAD even? Um, how can we come together to help share our both personal visions as well as the visions of the city? I mean, I think that... Uh you know, it's a, it's a really great question because it's something that we struggle with on a day-to-day -day bas basis. Um, what do we say yes to and what do we say no to? Uh, and I guess I have to go back to what seems like um, a very selfish response, which is that the space is first and foremost about an expression of what we're interested in. And so in the best of worlds, um, there's some mutual synergy between people who approach us and um, the work that we do. But um, I think that that's also what um, some other more public spaces that perhaps are nonprofit are supposed to be doing and, and are not doing, maybe they're not as accessible. Um, you know, and I, and I kind of do think that, I think because Perhaps we're approachable, and you can kind of come up and talk to us on a day-to-day -day basis. We're both at the coffee shop, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, it kind of makes that dialogue a little bit more challenging because it's a little bit more um, uh, casual. Because people come up and they want to have a conversation while we're doing something else, and we never really actually sit down and have a true discussion. Um, so I think that you know one of one of the things that we always personally start by saying is, well, let's schedule a separate time, or let's um, talk via email or a phone, and really have a conversation where you can kind of share your ideas. So giving the ideas room to breathe. But you know there there is. Um, 
always the chance that it's not something that my partner is interested in or it's not something that I'm interested in. And I think it's important to maintain a kind of sense of continuity in the programming that we do because then it kind of starts to reflect a bigger vision. And so one, once we kind of start to try to interject with some maybe community or cultural events that don't have to do with our programmatic vision, then it becomes a little bit more muddled and it doesn't really serve anyone that way. So it's, it's very complicated though. Hi, great job. Um, and mine kind of uh, is reflected off of what he was just asking, but I'm uh, actually interested in if there are any kind of plans or already something in place where there might be, I don't know, some type of like mentorship or idea sharing for people that want to like start groups or spaces or like uh, reoccurring events like you know they're having noise camp here today so maybe like kind of like you know outside like group discussions where people could interact with people who have been doing this for a while um, and how they've been successful and I don't know but is I think that um, I personally don't know if where that kind of group discussion is happening. I do think it happens on pages sometimes and on blogs. Um, so it happens a little bit more virtually, maybe through social media. But I don't know of any actual, like, you know, entities who have kind of formed collectives. And, you know, there used to be, I think, a little bit more of that, even with um, kind of like studio visits and that sort of thing. But for us, we've always gone directly to the people that we admire. Um, rather than kind of having a shared dialogue with a bunch of peers. So um, for Joel, he, he, his mentor was Farouk Zibay. And although Farouk didn't uh, own a space, he frequented a lot of spaces over the years and he knew what was good and what wasn't. And it, and it was more about Joel's appreciation for his personal philosophy. Um, so it's like stepping out of that just kind of direct question of like, where are the spaces? How can you develop spaces? And kind of more just trying to seek out the people that you have um, shared philosophies with. Sorry, thank you. Uh, someone from outside the city who wanted to come here to, to be creative and to experience the culture here. Um, and I, I liked your response, but I was wondering if you could maybe characterize the um, contemporary scene's response to these imported artists. Is there a concern that while they're attracted to the interdependent model, they might be compromising it by um, diffusing the art scene a little bit? Um, well, for starters, like while that was a, a direct response to an article that was talking specifically about New York transplants, I. I have to make it clear that like, it's not about where you live and where you're coming from that makes you an important or disrespected member of the community. Um, there are so many people that I could list off the top of my head who have arrived in Detroit in the past maybe 10 years or so, more so in the past five years, that I find so valuable and I've learned so much from and I'm so happy that they're a part of the scene. So, and it's partially because they carry um, a broader perspective, but also because they just happen to be like-minded people and they were attracted to the city because of their instincts. Um, and so, I mean, the responses that I've seen seem to be, you know, really polemical. They're either like, we don't want you guys, let's firebomb people's houses to, yeah, come on in, open doors, we need as, you know, as much as we can get here. And I just don't think that that's really helpful that, it's about individual cases, and that's kind of why I was trying to explain that for me, it's about um, what kind of person that you are, you know, and if you are living in a city that is focusing on things that aren't, um, aren't part of your ethics, like, you know, how much you pay for whatever, and you want to kind of live in a, in a city that exists somewhat outside of the margins of consumer culture, then um, I think let's bring them in, you know, because those are the people that are going to be helping us kind of maintain the, um, the scene that we have today that we love so much. Do we have one or two more? Or, oh, when? 
And you. you have such an interesting you have such an interesting background. I mean, having studied, having edited an arts journal, writing theoretically. Yeah, I'm just restless. That's and, all. Well, I'm curious. I mean, yeah. and you've had experiences in large and small institutions. Yeah. Um, from CCS to this place to Trina. So, so I'm curious, like, how you think that might inform your practice. I mean, I think my, my practice definitely reflects all these different structures, which is another great reason to use the term interdependent because I'm very conscious of the fact that Trina Soap is in some ways part institution, part commercial gallery. Um, you know, we kind of approach what we do in constant critique with the community. So um, all of the spaces that I've worked at have informed what we do at Trina Soap. Um, I think that, you know, because my partner has been a little bit more of an independent, of course, he's performed at other spaces, and more recently, he's um, programming elsewhere. I think that he kind of pushes us more towards the side of alternative. And then sometimes I use methods and structures and practices that I've learned at MOCAD, um, very few that I've learned at CCS, <laughs> um, because they work. And, um, and it's been helpful. For instance, we're a multi-use space. The space is large um, and we have large overhead. And so um, one of the things that we do is facility rentals. So it's like finding the balance of, and MOCAD was a great kind of parallel. You know, they, MOCAD is a multi-use space in that way too because they do facility rentals for their earned income um, as well. And so there I adopted the very necessary practices of learning how to plan a wedding and how to pull it off. And like, you know, I'm kind of the more administrative person of the two of us when it comes to that end of our operation. And so it's incredibly important. And I think that that's why it's important that you can't just try to live outside of the institution and, and the commercial gallery scene because um, it is all, it's all helpful. All right, thanks again. Thanks, Rebecca, for your thank talk. You. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, we'll be having more Detroit Speaks events in the fall. And also pick up that program guide. And as someone mentioned to tonight at 8 PM out by the Mobile Homestead, it's the 21st Annual Noise Camp. It's a noise music, electronic music, performance art, theatrical craziness that must be experienced, and it's free, it's open to the public. Come on by, and hope to see you around MOCAD again. Thanks a lot. <laughs>